Take a present. <laughs> hey, everybody. You got Scott Leese here, along with my friend Richard Harris, for another episode of the Surf and Sales podcast. We are joined today by fellow Bay Area transplant in Austin, <laughs> Daniel Molas. Daniel, hey guys. <laughs> director of uh, sales at Solar Winds here in, in Austin. And uh, we're excited to talk to him today. And he's fired up about the 49ers Super Bowl appearance this weekend, just like me. How's it going, That's Dan? right. It's going great. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm, I'm pumped to be here and excited for this week, that's for sure. But Good. You, you, are you, what's your confidence level on a scale of 1 to 10 about the game? Um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I know there's probably a pretty uh, broad audience you have, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Scott, what's, Scott, what's your confidence level? I already <laughs> – it's going to be – is it in uh, negative numbers at this point, Scott? No, no, no. I, I feel I feel pretty good. I feel yeah? pretty good. What, yeah. One to ten, Scott. What do you think? Uh, I think six out of ten times that 49ers win. All right. <laughs> doesn't mean we win on Sunday, but I, I feel six out of ten. What, what, what's the difference between a six and a ten in your mind? Uh, how much money I'm willing to put on it. <laughs> <laughs> so not very much. There you go. There you go. I was going to say, I know you. You don't gamble. Yeah, well, I, not I, with I, money I'm like that. So. Extremely confident. No, so you, Daniel and I uh, have known each other for, damn, yeah, almost about ten years now, I guess. Uh, yeah. Daniel was one of the first sales reps, first three or four maybe, um, at Main Street Hub, and ended up moving from San Francisco out to Austin. But Dan, tell us, you know, real quickly, like, give us some context, give the audience context about what you do right now. As far as uh, you know, the product that you're selling, Solar Solar Winds, the nature of your role, the sales cycle and price, things like that. Sure, sure. So right now I'm a director of sales at Solar Winds, based here in Austin, Texas, and I've been there about almost two years now. And over my my tenure here, I've been working with more of our uh, acquire more of the uh, on the acquisition side so working with the sales orgs of the companies that solar winds has been acquiring and helping them integrate into into solar winds and so it's a we we sell to it professionals so all things it right network management system management um monitoring tools for infrastructure database very very technical sale right and uh, it, things can, uh, sales cycles can range from literally one day to, you know, a year plus, right? So all things from transactional all the way through the enterprise. And that's part of the solar winds model, which is making it so anybody can buy these tools, whether you're at a fortune 100 company or you're a mom and pop business. And so, um, you know, uh, my, my time at solar winds has been, has been a lot different than where I came from, right? I came from yeah. smaller organizations that were growing and now I'm at a publicly traded company. Um, but that's kind of the gist of, of what I've been doing the last better part of two years. What, what are some of the, um, what are some of the less obvious differences between going to be, you know, one of the initial salespeople at an early stage startup company and, you know, selling and working for a massive global company, you know, like you are now? Well, the first thing is uh, quotas are massive. Um, I think a lot of people, especially when you're coming in maybe a, as an individual contributor, right? When I talk to a lot of newer reps, you know, and they get their quotas, they're like, whoa, whoa, that's like, that's big years. That's a, that's a big number, right? And, you know, one of the more uh, I guess you could say obvious things is like you got a brand name, right? It's a household name. You know, everybody in the IT space knows SolarWinds, knows or whatever big company you're at, right? If you're if you had a larger publicly traded company, you have that advantage or that brand awareness. Um, but I, I'd say um, another thing would be that sometimes people think these big companies have all their stuff together and that they're organized and everything's just dialed in, and that's very much not the case, especially yeah, when you're yeah. the companies who are who are acquiring other companies and. Um, you know, they, they need just as much help getting their people systems and processes in order just as much as this, the seed funded company, the series A, B, C, et cetera. Right. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your, your journey into sales leadership. I'm well acquainted with it, obviously, yeah. but, uh, but give, give, give Richard and the, and the listeners like, your story, how you got into sales. Were you, were you the kid, you know, 
selling baseball cards when you were a kid and mowing people's lawns and doing car washes and always trying to hustle and make a dollar? Or not? <laughs> Uh, I was, but I, I, I did it by getting a job really early. So like when I was, you know, I, I had little odd jobs here and there before I could legally work. But as soon as I turned 15, I started working at the mall selling luggage to me, Hartman, Swiss Army. So that was kind of my first, you know, people coming in, they're, they're literally training you on how to sell this stuff. I'm, you know, 15 trying to sell a $10,000 luggage package. I'm wow. no idea what I'm doing. No idea what I'm doing and, and failing epically, but you know, it was a seasonal gig. Um, and you know, as time went on, you know, I started my own little company, a catering company. I like to cook. I was sick of waiting tables. So I just started putting Craigslist, Craigslist ads up around the Bay area and taking catering gigs and hiring my friends because the money was better and it was more fun than, you know, waiting tables after doing that for quite some time. Um, but I fell into sales because I was lost and, you know, in my mid twenties, no idea what to do. And I heard my buddy got a $30,000 commission check. So I quit what I was doing and went and got a sales gig, <laughs> like straight up. Like that was it. Well, what? Like, well, I just, mean, just out of curiosity, cause I'm, I'm looking at your profile, right? Um, how much are you kicking yourself now that, you know, you were a sales and marketing intern at the Warriors and, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, hi, yeah, well, he was, he was right? there when the Warriors were terrible. Right. He yeah, earned yeah, it. Yeah. He earned yeah. it. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, truth be told there, just like a lot of internships, it's, it was just grunt work and there was zero exposure to, you know, anything that could actually help your sales career. But uh, it was a good, it was good conversation starter for getting interviews. Right. right? Uh, Sometimes you take those jobs because that logo means something, right? Like, just like for me, I'm like, oh, tell me about it. You know, and I'm, I'm sure in an interview, you'd probably give a little bit more detail, but you know, um, but that, that's always a fun thing. I had, I had a buddy of mine, like literally one of the smartest kids in all of university of Arizona. Um, and, and I know that shocks Scott for his ASU thing. He was <laughs> surprised that I mean, it's a low bar. Anybody... Yeah. He, he one summer decided to move to Chicago. This guy has a law degree and an accounting degree. And, uh, he moved to Chicago for the summer and he just like hawked peanuts at the Cubs and White Sox. <laughs> that was his summer gig, moved to Chicago. And it, as you said, it's a lot of grunt work, but it's a great conversation starter. Right. And you can always find somebody who's interested in it. So how did Absolutely. you, so, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, you were sort of failing miserably. Right. And um, from that, but when you, when you finally got out of school and you decided to get into sales, like, how did you start to educate? Did you join an organization that really valued onboarding some sales skills or was it, you know, just go figure yeah. it out, man. Yeah, no, um, I was fortunate enough to get a, to get a opportunity with Yelp when they were still growing. And I think at the time there was like maybe seven or 800 employees, but they had definitely had a global global presence and they had offices in like New York, Phoenix. I was in San Francisco and they had a world-class training program back then. It's probably even better now, but back then it was like, it was, it was amazing. Tons of, they gave you time and, and, and guidance and coaching. What kind and, of things did they teach you? Yeah, they, they were more focused on just their process, which was like, here's our pitch. Here's the messaging. Here's our objections. Master all this stuff. Role play, practice, you know, real time feedback. Um, that, okay. that sort of, there wasn't any sort of like sales per se, like, you know, challenger sale or, you know, Sandler training, like any sort of formal training like that. It was their process, which was successful. Like people were coming out the gates, right. plays and closing deals. Yeah. What, when you, Except me. <laughs> did, you know, and I'm just asking from, from a cause scripting matters in sales, right? Um, people sure. have varying opinions, but was it, Hey, here's the script, say this word for word, or was it, Hey, say this word for word a hundred times. And then you can craft it into your own, like how yeah. tight were they on that messaging? Yeah, yeah, I'd say uh, more, more of the, a, a mix of the two, right? I mean, you can only oversee so many people every day, right? Like, you, you're gonna, people are going to end up going rogue no matter what kind of show you run. So, uh, but it was definitely more of, uh, of the latter, right? Fig like, use this, dial it in, close, and then start to kind of uh, free flow or, or ad hoc and add your two cents or add your, add your spin to it. Right. Right. And that was something that they wanted to fire me about, like in the, my first couple of weeks, because I was such a hard headed, just arrogant, didn't know anything, but thought I knew everything kind of guy. So when did, uh, it, when did it first click for you? Um, probably about, you know, a couple of months in, I was like, in, I hadn't closed anything. I was dead last in my hiring class. And 
um, I realized that I was there to learn and I wasn't there to earn. I was there to learn. That was my entire like mission there was to learn and people were making money. I was like, okay, just forget it, forget it, forget it. And so I just flipped the switch and yeah, there were some great mentors there that were like kind of pushing you along and helping you and, you know, ch talking you off the ledge. And um, as soon as it clicked, I started to close and I started feeling really comfortable. I, you know, made a pivot and went and got with a startup with eight employees. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, um, it, it was really just a matter of a lot of trial and error and a lot of like self, uh, you know, just kind of you, you need to you need to implement what they're telling you to do. You don't know better than them. What, so you, you, you know, you, you said you went and joined a startup that was Main Street Hub working, working with me. Eventually we both left, went to another company, Help on Engine. So you've been a top performing sales rep, a top performing sales, sales manager. You've moved multiple times <clears throat> to different parts of the country and opened offices. Tell, tell people what it's like to be essentially like a GM where you're running your own satellite office. What, what do you need to be good at there that is not part of the regular job of a sales manager? What additional skills? Sure. Sure. So first of all, uh, anybody who is in a position in their career where that's being presented and they can do it, do it. It's a blast. It's, it's challenging. It's scary as hell. Uh, but it will make you stronger uh, personally and professionally. So, you know, obviously everybody's situation is different, right? If you got family and stuff like that, but if you're young enough in your career and life and you can pull it off, do it. Um, but I would say you've got to be number one, you've got to, you got to put the time in, like it's, it's, it's going to be crazy hours. Um, so you got to be willing to do that. Number two, I would say you've got to be crazy organized. You've really got, you got so much going on between hiring people, training. Um, you are the face and the, you're essentially the brand, right? Like when yeah, you, are, you come, are that company in that particular area, right? Correct. So when they, they, when, you know, insert company name and you're at the headquarters, there's all these people and execs and whatnot. But then when you go to a remote, a remote satellite office, people will affiliate that brand with you. And what that means is you've got to embrace that and you can't just sit behind your laptop or in your office and, you know, be a, a numbers crunchers, right? You've got to be the face. So what is, so you got to think to yourself, like, how do you want to, how do you want that to be represented, right? How do you want your team to see that? How do you want the people coming in to see that? How do you want the execs and their peers back in the other offices to, to hear about you? Because that's what's going to end up happening when they jump on their, you know, their Slack or back then Gchat, right? So it's just like, you know, you got to think about those things. You got to be organized. You got to be all in. You got to be, you got to be the culture, right? You're muted, You're muted Richard. Yeah. What, when you first moved around, what was the first city you went to open an office in? Uh, New York City. Okay. So here you are. Manhattan, oh, the, scary, the, scary, the scariest possible place to go in the United States to open an office. When you're I don't know. I, don't, I, threw him right in, I threw him right into the deep end. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is typical <laughs> Scott. But um, so you go there and you're going, you're, you know, this is like, this is it. This is New York City, to your point. Um, how did you find the talent? How did you attract people to you? Um, what was the job market like back then to, to find talent? Uh, were you were yeah. away from people? Were you just linked in it and you just went for it? Yeah. Explain to people how you just built that part of the process. Yeah, we had a limited recruiting budget. So, you know, we hit all your typical job boards. And then, you know, I would spend um, my, I spent all my time, you know, following up with uh, warm candidates and then cold sourcing candidates who had posted their resume and then also pinging every single person uh, account executive in probably the tri-state area uh, on LinkedIn and um, all of those things combined led to you know building a team right um, poaching people um, kind of luring people in with the idea of um, you know a startup right um, uh, references from the from the team right so as soon as we started hiring people we didn't wait for them to get comfortable like in our you know as soon as they, they they got the job offer it was like oh by the way can you please send me five referrals it wasn't 
Uh, we're not asking you to. It's like we're telling you, please send me referrals. So, you know, you got you just got to do what you got to do to get people in the door and build a team. Up, so. Okay, you just sort of had to hustle it out, right? Yeah, yeah, like straight up. And so, so did you go open another office at some point? Um, I ended up hopping around and um, kind of visiting the other offices, but at a different company, yes, I ended up opening an office in, in Phoenix with about 60 or 70 people in that so, one. So what did you learn from the first time you opened an office in a city to, you know, oh, the second time, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do this again, right? This was a yeah. this was part of the grind I can let go of or, or figure out. Sure, sure. I'd say um, it, it's there's there's a balance between over communicating and under communicating back to the home office. So uh, I'd say the I, I'd say the first time, you know, I did a really poor job staying connected to the home team and I tried to do everything on my own. And that was probably not the best way to go about it. Looking back on it. So my so next you gig, say but again, so when you say try to do everything on my own, what does that mean? Um, that means, you know, you're responsible for building a, a building a new a net new sales team in a in a remote location or a satellite location. There's a lot of there's a lot that goes to it, right? Just like there's a lot, whether you're at the home home office or not, you've got personnel challenges, you've got hiring challenges, you've got you know uh, you got a number to hit, so. Uh, reaching back out to the other managers, the other directors, uh, the other leadership for help, for guidance, right? I think that was, I could have done more of that. So the next go around, I did a lot of that, right? And I saw more success for asking for help, yeah. Yeah. help yeah, asking know, for guidance. You learn, you learn to realize that you're not alone and you don't have to be on such an island. Yeah. Time. So I want to, because this, this is interesting, because, you know, you know, you were doing this under Scott. It's, it's rare that we get to hear both sides of this story, right? So Scott, if you remember, um, what are, you know, if you were going back in time to, you know, let Daniel go do this, you know, what kind of things did you see him doing that you were like, oh, he might make a mistake there, but I'm going to let him make that mistake. Or what are other things that you wish he could have done differently? Like, because again, rarely do we get to talk to both people in this process. So I think it'd be fun to hear that side of it too. Well, I, I, one of the things that I've always been a big proponent about is giving people kind of their first opportunity. So I really wasn't too concerned about whether he'd make mistakes. I knew that he would make mistakes, right? <clears throat> he's, he's, he's not going to, you know, score a hundred on the test, so to speak. Um, but, you know, you, you, you look for people who have capacity beyond just being a sales manager, people who think more strategically about, um, you know, not just the process, but the recruiting, but the office layout, the culture there, things like that. Somebody who's going to be able to mentor and coach and guide and work on the psyche of everybody, as well as the implementation of, <clears throat> you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of everything and all the tactics and things like that. And, sure. you know, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're opening a satellite office and you're, and you're the, the VP of sales or head of sales or whatever, like, you need somebody who's just going to be able to own that. Like, I can't have my head in New York when I'm in Austin all the time, right? And, and so you look for somebody that you have good rapport with and that you trust and, you know, you have good communi communication with, you know? How did you, and again, so I'm assuming, Daniel, you'd already been promoted to a sales manager role at that point? So Scott, you did, just, you'd been able to Scott to sort of already coach him on some things and teach him about some things. But the thing that I really, I just want to reiterate is that, and this is one of the things I love about Scott is that he will always give that person a shot, right? You know, Scott, and tell me if I'm wrong, you'd much rather give that person a shot internally and let them move up right. than try and find someone externally who thinks they know it all and right. they might mess up your culture or they might um, not fit. You know? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, nine times out of 10, at least that's the way that I'm going or, or, or the way I, I want to go. You know, you, you look for people <clears throat> who have, who have potential and, and, and who you can tell are hungry to, to learn and grow and are not afraid of challenges. I mean, look, I mean, think about this, like, Daniel, Daniel had been in sales for a few years, <clears throat> multiple tech companies, um, you know, that, that, were, that were doing quite well, right? I, at the time, you know, he was probably like in his late 20s or something like that. And, 
you're, you're saying to this person, I need you to move all the way to Manhattan. I need you to move to New York City, the biggest city, you know, in the world, basically, right? The most expensive place in the world. I need you to figure all this shit out for me. I need you to build a team, implement what we know works, deal with vendors, all this kind of stuff. Like, that is an extremely daunting task, you know? And what, Dan, what Daniel said earlier when, when, you know, he was talking was, if you get such an opportunity, say yes, right? Yes. Say yes, go drink from a fire hose. Like, he'd probably tell you, you know, all the things that he learned from that experience that maybe would have taken two, three times as long if he just stayed at HQ, right? And, and, and so, you know, you, 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 you just got, you got to, when somebody has something, they don't have to have all of it. When they have something, you know, I just believe in giving, giving those people a chance and trying to support them as best I can along the way. Yeah, what, what, what kind of things did you notice in Daniel? And I know this isn't, hey, let's interview Scott Lease, but I just, again, it's such a unique situation. What were the things that you were like, okay, Daniel should be the guy we go do this, right? Versus somebody else in the team. Well, you, you know, here's one thing that um, will probably resonate with you because you're, you're the same way, but um, so Daniel had the ability to, to come up to me and call me on my shit, right? He had a way to come up to me and, and just be honest with me without being intimidated and, and deliver the feedback to me in such a way that, you know, didn't anger me, didn't frustrate me, didn't piss me off. And, you know, um, that's, that's harder, I think, than people realize, right? And it, it can be quite intimidating. And so, you know, that, that willingness to be bold and, and, and step up, you know, I respect that, you know, and that, that was, that's something unexpected maybe that, that people might not be, be thinking about that's kind of different. And I, I think, I think it's funny because I think most leaders want that, right? Um, but, but they say they want that. Right. They say they want it, but they, <laughs> they don't always deal with it. So, so Daniel, so, you know, as you, as you look back at that, right? Um, I sort of want to go back to your LinkedIn profile. Hold on, sort of, because that's, that's how I know you, um, other than Scott. Um, but, so you did that. You went from sales manager to senior sales manager. You were at Main Street Hub for two and a half years. Uh, you just, Scott leaves, right? So Scott goes to this other company called Outbound Engine that he and I both know. Um, what about Scott or what about leaders for you make you want to follow them? Because people, I always say, they quit leaders, right? They, they don't quit the job. They quit the leader, right? And I think a lot, of, a lot of people have said it way before me, so I won't take credit for it. But what are the things that you like to look for in leadership so that you can determine to take the right next gig for you? Sure. Um, uh, tr trust and transparency are, are absolutely critical. And, and, and those are non-negotiables. And, you know, you're going to meet a lot of people in your career at all different types of levels who, who, you know, may not follow through on their word or uh, may not be as reliable. And so, you know, those were a couple of the things that, you know, I, I wanted to continue having in my career and, 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 the, and the person and people I'm going to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be completely frank with you, that was still a time in my career, even though it wasn't that long ago, like where I was still pretty junior and still pretty, even though I had seen a lot and done a lot, like I was still pretty, uh, still pretty green in terms of like, like people management. And I just thought to myself, well, man, look at how many little wins, look, not even little, look how many wins I had under this guy in two years. I should probably keep going that direction. Like that's, that was my mindset. Like I was like, um, I should probably keep going because somebody you trust, somebody you look up to, somebody you can rely on, somebody who over communicates with you, somebody who tells you how it is and can kind of give you a path. Like I just was like, okay, there, there's something here. I should probably keep going. What do you remember? And I'm, I'm not doing this to pick on Scott, but what do you remember being one of those honest conversations that maybe you didn't really want to hear, but you know, you sort of look back and go, you know what, at least this guy's being honest, right? Like, cause we, we hear about, you know, transparency and honesty and, and all these kinds of things. And, and sometimes that means we have to be open to that, that constructive criticism, right? What were the things that you look for in leaders or any examples, I guess, is the question that you're like, Oh, when I saw Scott or I saw a leader do this, 
or when they also came and gave me this kind of feedback and I could take it in. Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing was he, he kept, he kept the man, like he kept us in the know, like there's going to be things you can't share with the team until it's official when you're, when you're an exec and you're behind the scenes, but like he kept us in the know and like what was coming. And I'd say, you know, probably 99.99% of the time it was nothing, anything like crazy, like, but you'd be surprised how far that goes with your people. I mean, leaders today will, you know, pivot at a dime and not tell their people until the day they want to do it versus like prepping people and teeing people up. So that, that was one of the, one of the things that, that, that was a pretty big deal. The next one was um, just the, the, the feedback on how to um, like, actually dealing and managing and coaching people up like in a day-to-day when you did a good job you know it when you did a less than stellar job you would hear about it right so he's not going to sit around and wait you know weeks or months or quarters to tell you something he's going to tell you in real time which um, obviously gives you a chance to adjust right so what were some of the biggest adjustments you had to make going from sales to management like if you, and if you're if you're giving that advice to people who think about going into management, I think I want to be a manager. What are some things like? Oh, you, you know, these are the good parts, but this is also what happens. You, you know, um, I kind of look at it like similar to how when I first started my sales career, I was not really into. I didn't really care how much money I made because I knew it was so new. I was like, well. I'm going to focus on kind of mastering my craft and then making money because I didn't know any different. I didn't know what I was doing really. So I was just like, let me learn. And I think going into management, you might have to have, I mean, now these days management, you can move into management, you can get pretty decent comp these days, but uh, it was a little bit of a different time. But now I would say, but you got to put your, your, your kind of, you know, your student hat back on and you got to be more about your people and more about and more selfless than selfish because it's not about you anymore, right? Um, so you gotta kind of readjust some of your expectations and understand that there's, there's gonna be a learning curve here and it might take you some time to get back to the earning expectations that, that you're looking to meet. Um, I, I, I would say um, uh, moving into management ver- versus sales, it's like you've gotta get rid of that rep mentality, right? And there's nothing wrong with being an individual contributor. It's a fantastic career and people continue to, to it, it's a great career path, but there's, there's a total mind shift that you have to happen. You know, a lot of individual contributors like to make excuses and maybe, you know, be a little loose and, and, and miss, you know, maybe miss deliverables here or like it's not as important, but when you're, a, when you're in a management spot, like you've gotta be on your stuff. You gotta be on top of your game you you can't let things slip through the cracks and you've really got to put your you got you you're now setting the example for people and like there's no like there's no going back to kind of having that rep mentality not that there's nothing wrong with it but it's just a total mind shift yeah. in terms of how, how you, you need to operate yeah I got, I got one more question on this topic um and i see this a lot and i experienced it in my career a couple of times of uh, you move from rep to management and now all of a sudden you really are managing your friends. You're managing, and I, you know, I know the culture Scott builds and you're at early stage startups and you do go out and you have a cocktail and you have a drink or you hang out on the weekends, particularly at those, you know, that's just the way the culture is built, right? Um, how did you navigate, for lack of a better phrase, you're, you're growing up to the next level while navigating your management role in your friendships? Because I, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Sure. Um, I was pretty fortunate to the, the the core group that I was like friends with had all been promoted already. So we we're all like in this transition together. And so I didn't, I never really uh, had to manage my friends per se. However, that being said, you've still got to hold them, whatever the situation may be, friends or not, to the same standards that you would anybody else. And a newer manager is going to you know, the reality is they, they might get stepped on or walked on a little bit more than a more seasoned manager. They might let things slide. And next thing you know, things might be a little more, um, I don't want to say out of control, but think people might be getting away with more or, or, or taking advantage of you. But um, I, I'd say 
you got to sit down with them and have that conversation and just be like, this is a, this is a situation. We can still have a beer after work. We can still go hang out on the weekend, but you know, Monday through Friday in the office, like this is like, let, let's, let's, let's have some boundaries here. Let's make sure we're on the same page because you know, I need your support here. Right. So you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta communicate. You gotta be transparent with them. You gotta make sure you set down some boundaries yeah. and, and, and not allow those things, those negative things to happen. Right. Scott, you know, you promoted a lot of reps to managers, right? You probably had to coach around this. Um, you know, for me, it was always about just stick to the process, right? Coach the reps to the process. You can't control people, but you can, you can manage and control a process a lot better. What advice would you give to people having watched this scenario occur? Because I think a lot of people run into this and they're not really sure or they're just uncomfortable or they don't want to be seen as the bad person anymore, or the bad guy. Like any advice from your end, Scott? Well, honestly, if you're still thinking like that, you're not ready to be a manager. <laughs> so you, you, you've sort of got to be willing to shed that a little bit prior to taking on, you know, the role. And, and that's easy to pick up and recognize as somebody who's running a whole department, a whole team. You know, you see. How do you recognize it? Well, you see Richard on the floor, like, you know, focused and on task as opposed to chit-chatting. You see Daniel on the floor helping somebody else, you know, close a deal because there was no, you know, sales manager around. Uh, you see, you know, people <clears throat> at lunch in the office kind of talking about, about work and, you know, certain people always kind of galvanize the group and are, and are leading by example and things like that. You know, so there's, there's these micro moments all the time <clears throat> that if your eyes and ears are open as a, as a, a leader leading the whole department uh, to me it, it it didn't seem doesn't seem hard to to pick up on and so you you early on start to start to differentiate yourself it's like yeah we're friends but like i'm here for a, ne a next level reason as well right and i hope you come with me on this journey and if you don't you know i'm gonna go anyway right <clears throat> um I'm going to change the topic. Yeah, um, go ahead. I've been dominating. Go ahead, Scott. On, on Daniel, Daniel here. How do you take somebody who has no technical sales experience and put them in a technical selling role and have them succeed? Is that, define, is that is it just like a technical? Well, you know, he's, he's selling computer hardware and all these things, like selling to IT, for example, right? Like, I don't come from that background, right? I don't know anything about all the computer parts are, you gotta talk to my brother, right? So how do you, t how do you take me, for example? Could I, could I sell that, that particular uh, product, all the different products that you have? How much different training is required to take somebody who has no super technical experience and turn them into a successful seller in a technical organization? Well, I, I think it's less challenging than you would think. Because at the end of the day, whether you're selling for a startup or a super transactional product to with a low ASP or to the SMB space or to the IT buyer or whoever, um, there's still an inherent sales motion process that we, you know, once you've got experience that you, you need to follow, right? Like everybody will understand yeah, you got to build some trust and rapport. You've got to find some pain. You've got to build value. You've got to like, you got to go down this motion, right? Whatever you're selling, right? On the technical side, it just takes time to be straight with you. Like as long as you've got, right, if you've got somebody who's willing to put in the time and effort and learn because you have, you know, I'm more fortunate enough to have documentation and resources and videos and learning. How, training resources. how much, how much time, how much time would you advise? You're right. If, if you were, if you were, if you were a found, if you were talking to a founder out there who's got a technical sale, what would be your advice? Would you give salespeople a month, three months, six months, a year? How much time is is required to to learn everything that they need to learn? I mean, I've I've kind of I've been singing the same tune for quite some time. I think it takes at most a, a good salesperson about six months to really get their grasp, even if they even if they're having success, to really get un, like to really understand. That doesn't mean that they need the entire six months to, to master the product or to truly understand all the use cases and to get into the technical weeds. I mean, chances are if you've got a technical sale, 
right? And that's a broad term in this in the context of this conversation. You may have some technical resources, sales engineers and whatnot, to kind of help with those more technical deep dives. But you you can still like you still have to set a foundation of training people to sell how you're supposed to sell, which is don't just go from you know, intro to product feature to quoting them, right? Like that's not how you're going to move deals, right? You've got you've to talk about their problems and what they're trying to solve. That doesn't require technical aptitude, right? So to answer your question, like obviously like a specific um, like variables aside, like as long as you can understand a process and stick to your sales chops, you can sell a technical product too. That's my, I'm like, I, I, I firmly believe that as long as you're being provided with resources and, 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 is it, and, um, is it a, is it a different type of, of DNA that's required for a hunter versus what you're doing now? Yeah. You need more patience. That's for sure. Because you're not going to, you know, more patience on the post initial sale but on both, on both ends, because like on a more, general, you need more patience. yeah, because think about it, right. If you're selling, um let's just say i'll give you a simple one like if you're selling a tool to like monitor your website if it's up or down that's like a commodity now everybody's got it like it comes with like some websites that you can like go to i think it comes with like a GoDaddy site these days so you might be selling something that people can get anywhere and really easily and so um they might be taking time to evaluate other vendors and things like that and so there, there's you know if you're looking for instant gratification i mean it probably won't be the best could not be maybe maybe not the best uh, path to take, right? And on the back end, you know, you've got to make sure you know your your customers are using these tools and their their team members are getting trained up, and you got to follow follow up with them and make sure that everybody involved, from the practitioners using it to the people signing the check, know what's going on, right? And so um, it, it it's it's different than um, kind of what you just described, but yeah, I think. You know, what, what it takes to get people, somebody ramped up is all the same things you look for, even if you're not looking for a technical sale. You need somebody who understands the, just the, the, the actual, like how to sell, right? Like that is always going to be the foundation that's going to take anybody, whatever you're selling, ahead of somebody who's maybe uh, obviously greener if they're just learning or somebody who's been around the block and just wants to do it their way. Do you have any, do you have any tips? for helping sales managers and, and leaders deal with uh, sort of training fatigue, right? Sales managers I have found often kind of get tired eventually of explaining the same, the same pitch, the same process, the same product over and over and over and, and look, you know, they start looking for bigger, better challenges. Um, I think that's natural. I think we all do that. What I find now is that the time it takes somebody to experience training fatigue is shrinking, right? It's like, oh man, I've been a sales manager for like six months and I'm, get, I'm getting tired of like training these new hires. It's like, dude, you've been in the role six months? Come talk yeah. to me after you've been doing this for, you know, yeah. 10, 15 years, right? Like, yeah. how, how are you working with the other managers there yeah. and helping them overcome that kind of training fatigue yeah that, that's a great question i think there's twofold number one is you got to create a self-learning environment so you've got to you've got to make sure that whatever you're putting out there you give you have act the team has access to it to self-serve right because at the end of the day um people can sit through lectures and training webinars and watching demos and shadow but you got to give them the tools and push them to do this stuff on their own. And a good salesperson is going to go home and read that stuff at night, at lunch, during the day, and they're gonna study it and take it seriously because they wanna master what they're selling. And then, the you're, second, giving, and then you're giving sales managers a bit of relief? Correct. The second part of it is you gotta switch up the voice. So, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of um, the sales management team and whatever department you're in, right? Like where I, I've had, you know, five, six, seven plus managers under me before. And you get them to, uh, to switch, uh, to coach each other's teams. Yeah. Like, yeah, like we you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. right. And, and, and sometimes it's good for both parties. It's good for the manager because they get to get a fresh face and it's good for, and, and a fresh set of problems and challenges, even though 
chances are it might be the same stuff. And then the, uh, the, the rep gets a different voice. And so I'm a huge fan of, 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 of kind of pulling those two levers to, to help folks in that arena. Nice. I got a couple quick hitting yes, no questions for you. Played this game early, earlier today. You ready? Sure. Should marketing own a revenue number? Yes, yes. or no? Should salespeople get comped on the renewal? Yes or no? Yes. Do you know as much about equity and stock options as you should? Yes. Oh, tell me more about, about that one. Because I would think that a lot of people, most people that I've been asking these questions to have been replying, no. How did you go about really truly understanding what your stock options mean, what your equity stake uh, is worth in terms of the real value, right? Um, did you did you get that knowledge and understanding through reading, from talking to people? Where'd you get it from? Yeah, I went straight. Like as soon as I, you know, these conversations or the the you know, you sign a piece of paper and you know what's going on. I go straight to the source. So <laughs> I would go straight to somebody in finance or whatever the you know, especially starting at a new place, new company. You know, go straight to the the source and start diving into what this means. I've had the same conversation around, you know, stock options and all that and equity, all that stuff with like, call it like a CFO or, you know, somebody in, in fi head of finance or whatever at different organizations. I've had the same conversation like five times because even though I've heard it over and over and over and over, I just want to hear it again. Cause I just want to make sure I'm not crazy. I want to make sure this is exactly how it works. And it took me a long time and it, I'm still learning stuff about it that because there, it's, it's, especially now that I'm at a publicly traded company, um, I'm still learning, you know, how things work and things I need to pay attention to. And um, so I'd are say early passing, on, are you, passing, are you passing that knowledge on, on down yet? Or do you, do you spend time educating and teaching, you know, your team? Do you feel any kind of responsibility? Absolutely. A absolutely. Especially with, you know, you know, especially with some of the team members who maybe they're doing really well. And it's just like, sometimes it's, they, there might be a lot of like, well, what else can I help you with? And kind of, you know, I'll have a lot of life conversations about, yeah. you know, how to buy a house and things to pay attention for, uh, for the, like for, for, for future investments or, you know, trade, uh, blogs that we read on like, you know, um, lifestyle stuff. And so like, that that that's always a fun conversation when you don't have to talk about somebody's performance because they're always hitting 140 percent to go every month you can start talking about yeah. other things to make them a, a more uh you know make them more educated on other topics like this right any uh any big bold predictions for 2020 for the sales profession <sighs> yeah i think okay so i think a lot more people are going to start you know leveraging linkedin like, I know that's been a hot topic and, you know, I'll be the first to admit, you know, it's something that I, 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 I could do a better job at, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a personal choice. Right. So it's just like, I, I haven't dove in for, for whatever reason, but, um, I, I'm also, I've always been that type of person who's like, if everybody's doing something like I've always kind of gone against the grain and, um, a lot of people are going to start using LinkedIn more, but for the folks like me who aren't as active, you can still be successful and have a great career. So, <laughs> uh, that's a contrarian point of point of view that I think is important for uh, right. So you don't have to do yeah. it. I think there's tons of advantages to it, and I'm not I'm not I'm not you know hating on it at all. I think there could be a ton of value I bring out there and share, and you know connect with more people and whatnot. But I think for the folks who are reluctant, just remember that. You, do you stay true to yourself and you know, you don't have to do that and you can still have a, a successful, you know, career. That's like it. good advice. Yeah. What can we do for you, bud? We always try to end the show asking folks, you know, what advice can we provide for you? What help can, can we, can we give? Maybe you want to ask that question of Richard since you guys just kind of getting to know each other. Um, you, know, you and I talk periodically. So, you're probably tired of hearing from me after all these years. <laughs> um, I, I'd say for if you got like let's let's put let's put a mock scenario together and see maybe you know high level how you would how you would maybe handle it. So you know I've 
I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working in a much larger company now, a lot of, a lot of different personalities, a lot of different, um, you know, init strategic initiatives that I'm getting my hands in and, um, you know, more specifically, you know, working with, um, some acquired companies and, um, helping them me mesh into our company. And so if you were tasked with that, what are some of the things, what are some of the first things that you want to kind of know or, or, or what are some th things that come to mind that, you know, you dive it right into? Yeah, I think I, I'd want to try and define what success looks like um, from your vantage point. But then I would also go as, to a couple of people above you, right? And even from different departments, what does success look like, right? Um, if you're tasking me, this, this is, I do this all the time with people. If you're tasking me to integrate these two companies, success looks like blank, blank, and blank. And go ask the leader of this department and the leader of this department. Ask it, ask that truly in silos. Don't tell them you're asking each other, right? Go to your boss and ask them that. Figure out what you think it is. Go to the team that's been acquired and say, what do you think success looks like so that we make this? And now you have this vision of what success is, right? As opposed mm -hmm. to just sort of trying to put it together. Um, you can start to put some definition. And they're all going to give you some, everybody's going to answer that question with very random uh, generic buzzwords. Oh, we expect revenue growth. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Like, you know, talk to me about that. Like, what is your expectation to get there? How do you see that happening? Cause you're going to have to drill down and not listen to these buzzwords. Um, sure. it's probably, it's a great exercise also in just sort of honing your own discovery skills, right? Cause maybe you're not doing as many sales calls these days, but you're selling internally. So from a management perspective, that's how I would see it is really define success. Then from that, you know, try to determine what that success timeline looks like and then break that down into more micromanaged things that you can start to look at and control around process and, and what sure. you can do to influence people to support you in that because you can only control the process more than the people. Yeah. Uh, you can only influence the people. So that's, that's probably the first thing I would do. Um, I would also reach out to other people, you know, whether it's in the industry and, and again, you know, being respectful of the current company, what's, what's tolerant to speak to, you know, competitors or frenemies or whatever um, to say, how did you do this? Or reaching out to someone completely different, like in a different industry, like me, you know, nothing about solar winds. And, um, you know, maybe what I said was the right path for you to try. And I don't know. Sure. Um, so going to that route. Um, That's awesome. So, I would, so for me, it's, a, it's much more about, the research side and doing a little bit of pre-planning before I just execute right away. Right. And you do have to do that in a timely manner. You can't take six months to figure this out. <laughs> most times, right. Um, yeah. But you could take a couple of days. Right. That, that's sort of my, my thought around how to do it. The other thing I would do then is um, once I understand the tasks, I try to delegate as much as I can to other people so that it can get done faster so that you can start to see, uh, you know, the people who actually want to be, you know, promoted and moved up, see how they handle a task. I think you talked earlier today about completing, you know, getting, getting things done on time and those kinds of things. And then you, you really sort of start to move chess pieces instead of checkers. So sure. That, that's no, great. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Scott, anything you want to add to that? Is it something I missed? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I go right to the, I go right to the people and right to trying to make an assessment of who are, who are these team members that I'm, I'm now getting and what are they all about? And look, I, I think if we're all being honest, I think when a company gets acquired, people are scared. I think, one of, I think the alarm bells go off in people's head like, oh shit, I'm about to lose my job because they think they're going to get fired or laid off or the different alarm bell goes off. It's like, I don't want to go work for this other huge company like i I'll, I'll listen to what they have to say but like you know i'm probably going to move on so for me i'm thinking i got to figure out real quick who do i have what do i have to work with here who wants to be here who doesn't want to be here and i i've got to sort that out and not waste my time on the people who already have half a foot one whole foot out the door and focus quickly on the people who are truly open and or excited and people that I, you know, might be able to lean on and make this process go a little smoother. It, it feels similar to me 
in nature if I'm going into an existing sales org and taking over for the previous VP of sales. I got to sure. figure out sure. who do I have, who wants to be here, who's open, open to change, who's, you know, needs to move on. And, and I got to do that real quick. That, that, that's, those are the alarm bells that go off in my mind. Sure. Oh. Solid. Cool. Solid. I appreciate that. All right, bud. Good to see you, man. Always good uh, chatting with you. Keep up the good work. Big things still to come. Dan Molas, everybody. Dan, Hi, guys. Thanks Dan, for having thanks me. Thanks so much, bud. If I can ever be of help, um, Scott's not around or he's gotten too big <laughs> and he won't talk to you anymore or something, you know, I'm here to help. Never. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Hey, bud. Hi, brother. All right, take, take care.